Hello and welcome to today's webinar, High Probability Trading. I'm Dan Passarelli of MarketTaker.com. And uh, I just kind of want to start out by saying welcome everyone. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, new students here, although I also see some a couple familiar faces as well. <clears throat> Now, before we get started, I want to point out that options are not for everyone. You should read characteristics and risks of standardized options before trading. Get a copy of that by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. That's home of the Options Clearing Corporation here in Chicago. All right. <clears throat> so I talk to a lot of traders every year. In fact, let me give you a little bit of a background. So once again, my name is Dan Passarelli. I started my career down on the trading floor in Chicago, um, home of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, which is the birthplace of listed options. And I was a trader down on the floor. So I, I, I traded as what they call a market maker for many, many years. I was a professional trader for a long time. And uh, then, oh, what was it? Nine years ago now, we started Market Taker Mentoring. And we put over 2,500 students through our programs in one way or another. And in working with our students, as well as doing presentations just like this one and presentations for uh, other organizations across the, well, actually across the globe, <clears throat> I talk to thousands and thousands and thousands of traders a year. Now, as you would imagine, you know, there's sort of a pyramid effect. Most of the traders I talk to are beginners. And then, you know, there's less and less people of, uh, who are more advanced traders, you know, just like anything else. A lot of people start something, a lot of people don't finish it. It takes a special person to really get to the advanced levels of being a trader. So when I talk to people who, especially people who are more basic people, what I end up seeing is I end up seeing some common issues. And one is people think, well, I need to be able to predict the market really, really well in order to be a successful trader. And as far as that goes, nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, granted, yes, if you had tomorrow's newspaper today, you could be a great trader, but that's not really what's at the heart of being a good trader. What's at the heart of being a good trader is being good with numbers. There's a lot of parallels that we can draw between trading and gambling. But good traders are not gamblers. Good traders are more like the casino. Vegas odds people and people who come up with the games at casinos, they're not in the business of gambling. They're not trying to get lucky and win money. The casinos, the Vegas odds people, they're in the business of statistics. Now that is the business that you should be in. If you're a successful trader, that's the business you are in. <clears throat> now, also in trading, there are people who are called quants, short for quantitative something or others. They're basically like Vegas odds people. They figure out the odds of something happening, and they look at the risk and reward and the payout structure, and they determine whether a trade has an edge to it. Is statistically beneficial, can statistically dominate other trades. <clears throat> so that is the nature of being a successful trader, is becoming the casino and not the gambler. In order to do that, you don't necessarily have to have a PhD in mathematics or anything. There are some very basic principles they require just really some simple math. I mean, they're, they're predicated on very, very advanced math. But as far as you're concerned, it requires just very, very simple math, but a little bit of an education. You have to know a little bit about option pricing. Now, at the heart of option pricing is volatility. Volatility for anything mathematical could be stocks, could be the height of children in a room, could be anything is a measurement called standard deviation. <clears throat> when Fisher Black and Myron Scholes were putting together the options pricing model, 
before they came along, a lot of people tried to put together an option pricing model, but they just couldn't figure out this sort of missing ingredient until Black and Scholes realized that the ingredient that other people weren't putting in their models was simply a volatility input. And they decided that they would use annualized standard deviation in order to measure volatility. And the idea is if we took the closing prices from the last, say, 30 days of a given stock, <clears throat> averaged it to find the mean, we could then rather simply calculate standard deviation. Now, you don't need to know the formula for standard deviation because as far as what's useful to you, uh, David, I'm on the standard deviation slide. You're seeing that? Everybody seeing the standard deviation slide? <clears throat> oh, well, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. I forgot to uh, start the slides. So we're talking about high probability trading. <clears throat> and back to standard deviation. So standard deviation um, measures volatility. What we do is we take the last 30 closing prices of a stock, find the average, which we'll call the mean in mathematic terms, find the standard deviation, then we annualize it. We use annualized standard deviation basically to make the last 30 days representative of a one-year period. Now we've got something that's very, very useful to us. Now this measurement in and of itself doesn't necessarily have anything to do with options. This is just measuring how volatile a stock is. As far as when it comes to options, we kind of need to add just a couple more, I guess we'll call them ingredients to this uh, delicious pot of stew we call option pricing. Now what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about options, excuse me, in the context of income trades. Now how many people are familiar with income trading? Have you ever heard that term before? Um, I've got a whole lot of new faces here, so I want to kind of get an assessment of who everybody is. I'm just kind of getting a couple people. Let's do this. Everybody go down to where it says questions and rate yourself as, as an option trader as either beginner, intermediate, or advanced. And I know those terms are all kind of relative to your own perspective. <clears throat> All right, we're getting some beginners, some intermediates, and we're getting a couple advanced. Okay, good. So we got a pretty big mixed pot here. That's okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm going to make this presentation accessible to everyone and give the beginners kind of a crash course. Intermediate guys, you're going to be picking up a whole ton here. And you advanced guys, you're going to pick up something in about five slides. I'm going to show you something that you probably are not familiar with that you're going to love, and it's going to help improve your trading. All right, so income trades, okay, so let's back up for a second. With options, you know, for you guys who are beginners, like a lot of people think of options as, oh, yeah, if I think a stock is going up, I can buy a call, and if the stock goes up, I make a leveraged profit. This is great. And don't get me wrong, that is great. That's a really great feature of options, leverage. But... It's, it's probably the hardest way to make money as an option trader. As an option trader, um, you got a lot working against you. Then. Notably, if I'm buying a call or buying a put for that matter, what do I have working against me? You guys tell me. If I'm, if I'm an option buyer, what do I have working against me? Don says time. John says theta. Pete says decay. These are all basically synonyms, and these are all the answers I'm looking for. When you buy option, well, any option, as time passes, the option loses value. So if I buy an option, <laughs> Manuel, Manuel says everything. You have everything going against you if you buy an option. Well, you don't necessarily have everything because, and, and actually, let's talk about that point. If I buy a call, I have directional risk, right? I can make money if the stock goes up. I lose money if the stock goes down. That's called delta. That's my sensitivity to delta. But as time passes, options lose value. So right, man, well, all you guys, you were right. 
is t uh, no, right now I'm on the income slide, uh, income trade slide, John. <clears throat> so right, so when it comes to um, option buying, because options lose value as time passes, that's a hurdle that you have to overcome. That's pretty challenging. So what a lot of people like to do is they like to sell options. Now, I have somewhat of a preference to selling options, but not exclusively. You know, um, there are definitely situations where it's appropriate to buy. Those are generally speaking when you're looking for a pretty big move in a stock. Otherwise, the time decay does kill you. But when you get a big move, you can have an extremely leveraged profit. So, you know, there, there's definitely room for both here. But generally speaking, I like option selling because as time passes, you can make money. Even if it goes directionally against you a little bit, you can still make money. Yeah, John, I'm going to get into that during this presentation. You're going to love this. <clears throat> All right. So these income trades have time on their side. That's all income trades are. They're, they're option trades where you're selling options, but you're doing it in a protected way. You're doing it as part of a spread. So these are high probability trades by nature. All right. You've got a lot on your side. You've got a lot working for you. Basically, you sell an option as part of a spread. And if the stock does anything except move through the strike price, you make money. So it can go your way. It cannot move at all. It can even go a little against you. You still win. So if you think of trading as sort of a bell curve, you know, like stocks can move as a bell curve. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, there's more chances of winning than losing. So they're high probability by nature. And we can measure this. They're measurable, predictive results. I'm going to show you how to measure your chances of success in just a second. So when we talk about income trades, we talk about there's a lot of different types of income trades, but today we're going to talk specifically about credit spreads. This idea of selling options is we want to sell them and then buy them back for later and buy them back later for less money and profit from time decay. But if I sell, say, a call, let's start with that one because I think most of you experienced guys are, you know, as soon as I say sell a call, you're thinking, oh, no way, you're crazy. I would never sell a call. And you're right, you shouldn't. If you sell a call, what happens if the market goes down? Well, you make money. What happens if the, I guess I should say the stock that it's on, what happens if the stock doesn't move? Well, you make money. What happens if the stock goes up a little bit? You make money. What happens if a takeover is announced and the stock goes up 50%? Well, you're going to get creamed. You're going to be trying to make a tiny bit because when you sell options, you can only make the premium that you collect day one. That's your maximum profit potential. But if it moves drastically against you, you can, you can have an extremely leveraged loss. So we need to do it as part of a spread. Manuel says naked calls are restricted by his brokerage, right? Obviously, not all brokerage firms. There are some brokerage firms that just blankly allow them. Not many. There are some that make you qualify for a certain level of trading. Um, it's my opinion that you don't ever need to be selling a call. Selling puts is a little bit of a different story. There's a place for that, but that's we're not talking about that in this presentation. We can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A sec, uh, section if somebody has questions. What we're going to focus on here is spreads. Why? Because spreads have limited loss. So there's a situation where you want to sell a call because you think a stock won't rise above a certain place. Well, guess what? You can sell that call, but then buy a higher strike call so that your loss potential is no longer unlimited. It's truncated. So the, this is called a credit spread. That's a call credit spread that I was just describing, where you sell a call and buy a higher strike call with the same expiration date on the same underlying. It's limited profit potential and limited risk. Put credit spread, same thing. Sell a put and buy a lower strike put with the same expiration on the same underlying. Now, here's the way I want you guys to think about this. 
And sometimes when I explain this this way to people, something just kind of clicks. They have like a little bit of uh, what people sometimes refer to as an aha moment. <clears throat> the short option, because there's one short option and one long option, right? The short option is the trade. The short option is the option you either make or lose money on. The long option is the insurance policy. Now, every once in a while I come across people who just love selling puts. And they say, now, Dan, why would I want to do a spread when if I just sell the put and not a put spread, I make so much more because I'm not just wasting all this money on the insurance policy. You know, if I can sell a put for three bucks, but it costs me, you know, a buck and a half to buy the other put for protection, I'm cutting my profit potential in half. Right? You ever hear somebody say that? You ever think that for yourself? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that that's not entirely true. It's true on the surface. But if instead of selling one put, you sell two put spreads, you can take in the same premium and you can do it with way less risk. Now, this is our first foray today into the concept of trading smarter and more logical and maximizing your risk reward. For traders who are just trying to, you know, generate income out of the market, not get a sign, like sometimes investors will sell a put so that they can get assigned and buy the stock. Uh, that's a technique that Warren Buffett used uh, on more than one occasion. I think uh, I know of two cases, two documented cases where he did that. He sold puts. Market went down. He got assigned, bought the underlying, and then held it, and the market rose, and he made a killing. Now, that's fine if you're an investor type. Warren Buffett is an investor. If you're a trader whose hold time is maybe a week or two weeks or three weeks and you never want to own the underlying because maybe you don't have that much cash in your account or maybe you just don't have any interest in owning the underlying and holding it for a year, you're just trying to generate income. You're way better off with the spread so that you have way lower risk and can still make the same amount of money. All right. So this is what a credit call spread looks like. This is called a profit and loss diagram or P&L diagram. Let's say there's a stock and maybe it's over here. It's down here around say uh, 40 bucks. I sell the 50 strike call and I buy the 55 strike call. And maybe the net credit, that's why they call it a credit spread because I'm actually taking in money when I make this trade. Now that doesn't mean profit, the money I take in is my potential profit. <clears throat> so I take in a potential profit of less, let's say a dollar and a half. So that's 150 bucks of money because it's always times 100 with equity options. So that's my maximum potential profit. Now to find out my loss potential, I take the difference between the two strikes. So 55 minus 50 is five minus a buck and a half minus the premium is three and a half bucks. Now, at first you look at that and you say, wait a minute. So you're saying my maximum profit is smaller than what I can lose? That doesn't sound very good. I can make a buck fifty, I can lose three fifty. That's a bad risk reward. Well, no, it's not necessarily. In, in the one hand, it feels like it kind of goes against everything you're taught day one as a trader, you know, big profit, small losses, right? but we have to factor in probability. Now, Emmanuel is asking a question here that fits right into what we're talking about. He says, well, is this bullish or bearish? Well, I like to call it not bullish. So I'm not gonna say it's bearish. It does make money if the stock goes down, but it also makes money if the stock doesn't move. It also makes money if the stock rallies up to the break even point. If it goes from 40 up to 50, all the way up to 51 and a half, that's our break even, the premium collected plus the short strike. If it rallies from 40 all the way up to 51 and a half, I make money. 
So I can't really say it's bearish because if it goes up a little bit, I make money. So I like to say it's not bullish. <clears throat> so, you know, if we were to draw sort of a bell curve, which we were looking at before, let's see here. We'll grab a pen off here. And like, okay, so here's the stock. All right, let's say, let's just call it, say, 44. Well, if we think about, and technically it's not a bell curve, it's a log normal distribution. It would look something sort of like this. I don't know if I drew that in exactly the right place, but the concept is, actually I didn't draw that in the right place at all. Okay, let's say here's the, under, here's, here's the underlying stock. We'll call this uh, 45 bucks. So just like our bell curve that we were talking about before, look, there's a 50% chance of it going down and there's a 50% chance of it going up. So if it goes down, that's 50% of the time, you're going to be a winner. This is all statistics talk. If it goes up, part of that 50% of the time you make money, but part of it you lose money. So your odds of success are better than 50-50. In fact, they're way better than 50-50. Now Manuel points out something else that's important. He says, beware of earnings news. Right, so let's talk about this. This whole idea here is that it's a short volatility strategy. So I mean that literally and kind of like representatively. Because if there's a huge move down, yeah, you make money, but you would have made way more if you would have bought a put. If there's a huge move up, you're going to lose money. The best case scenario here is that there's not a big move in either direction. So then you're not leaving money on the table, and, well, you're definitely going to make money. So think of it as, you know, when you short something, you want it to be low. So here you want volatility to be low, and so basically we're shorting volatility. <laughs> All right, now Richard kind of follows up to something we were talking about before. He says, can you ever get assigned on the short strike position even if you have the long position for protection? If so, how do you avoid this? <clears throat> so, yeah, you know what? Actually, Richard, I'll tell you what. Hold that question because um, that is going to come up in just a couple slides. I, I plan on addressing that, all right? So I'm going to delete your question if I fail to address it. Uh, just ask again, but we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Before we get into assignment, let's talk about this. We want to know what our chances of success are. And, you know, I mean, before getting into the mathematics of trading, you know, I think a lot of people who are really new to options, who are novices, you know, you say, well, what's your chance of success in this trade? And they'll say, oh, you know, I think it's pretty good. Well, I think it's pretty good is not an answer. We need a number. We need the exact mathematical probability of success. Well, geez, how am I supposed to know that? You know, yeah, sure, I think the stock's not going to go above 50, but I don't know my exact odds of success. Well, actually, you do. If you use Delta. Delta is the rate of change of an option position's value as the underlying stock goes up and down. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. But there's another definition of delta. It's the likelihood of an option expiring in the money. So look, here's some calls here in whatever this is. What if I were to sell, you know, maybe uh, these calls right here? Okay. Maybe I sell these calls and I buy these calls. <clears throat> so these are the 80 calls. If I sell the 80 calls and they have a 42 delta, that means they have a 42% chance of being in the money at expiration. Okay. So what's that implication? Well, that means there's a 40% chance of the stock being above 80. Okay, well, if the stock's above 80, that's where we run into trouble. Okay, so if there's a 42% chance of the stock being above 80, there's logically a 58% chance of the stock being below 80. 
So there's a 58% chance of us now running into trouble by the stock being above 80 at expiration. Now this is sort of like, you know, it's kind of an estimate. The mathematics are not exact by nature. That's not Delta doesn't exactly calculate that for you. And there's a little room between the break even and the strike itself. And technically the stock could go through 80 and then come back down. But it's a nice handy dandy little guide of what your chances of the stock being above the strike at expiration and being a lousy trade. John says, what do you mean, what did you mean by shorting volatility? Well, John, if I put on a credit spread, do I want a big move if I put on a credit spread? No. Right? If there's a big move in the underlying and it goes against me, I lose money. If there's a big move in the underlying and it, you know, it, it doesn't go through the strike, in fact, it goes my way, but it's a gigantic move. I made money, but whoop de doo everybody else made a whole bunch more money. I made money, but I did it in a, in a suboptimal way. You know, like if I sell a credit spread, John says, big move down, you gain. Yeah, but big deal. You know, if I sell a credit spread for a dollar and the stock, you know, it's a hundred dollar stock. I sell a credit spread for a call a credit spread for a dollar and the stock goes bankrupt the next day. Yes, I made a dollar. But if the stock's at 100 and I buy the 100 strike puts and the stock goes bankrupt, now I'm buying a yacht. So, you know, this is the difference between being, you know, a trader who uses mathematics and gains an edge and makes a lot of money in the long run, or a trader who's happy to make a buck when he should have made a bunch more. It's all about picking the exact right strategy for the exact market situation that's going on right now. This is what separates good traders who make money consistently and profoundly in the long run or traders who, oh, you know, kind of bump along and, oh, that's a good one. Oh, well, you know, I made 5% this year, even though the market made 15%, right? Uh, John says, are you referring to credit spreads, calls and puts for the big move expiration? Yeah. Credit spreads are not good for big moves. You can still make money with a big move if it goes in your direction, but you leave a bunch of money on the table and you, you know, you're know kind of a lousy trader in that regard. Now, don't get me wrong. Usually stocks don't make big moves. Uh, CP, the slide's not frozen. I'm, I'm just talking. <clears throat> Usually stocks don't make big moves. That's the whole idea of the log normal distribution, kind of that bell curve looking thing I showed earlier. What that says is that small moves are more common than big moves. But sometimes you expect a big move. You know, for example, right now in the market, I mean, this is, uh, let's say it's date, March uh, 8th or something like that. Um, yeah, March 8th, 2017. You know, I've heard some traders saying, hey, you know, I think we're set for a pretty big correction. Well, they're not selling call credit spreads if they're looking for a big correction. They're buying puts and not even put spreads because they don't want to limit their profit potential. And that's fine for them because if they're right, they're going to make a killing. Now, for me, if I'm selling a, and if, and if I were bearish, I was looking for a correction, that's exactly what I would do. Now, for me, in the short term, I don't know, I don't think there's going to be a correction in the next couple of weeks. You know, there is some economic evidence that there, it's maybe not unlikely that there could be a pretty big pullback towards the end of this year. That's what a lot of the smart money is saying. And that's what I believe too. But <clears throat> the next couple of weeks, I don't think there's going to be a correction. So I'm not buying puts. That'd be silly. I lose on time decay. I might sell call credit spreads if I think the stock won't rise above a certain point. So this, this is what separates good traders from bad traders, knowing which strategy to put on when. Now I'm focusing today just on income trades and specifically just on credit spreads and very, very specifically just on a call credit spread in right now. You get a lot of bang for your buck trading credit spreads. They're one of your most useful strategies and maybe one of your most used strategies once you really get the hang of it. But 
you got to have a lot of tools in your tool toolbox. Show up on the work site with uh, nothing but a Phillips head screwdriver. You're going to do great when you need it, but when you got a pound of nail, you're in trouble. So I'm going to kind of show you the credit spreads are kind of the leather man of option trades. They can't do everything, but they sure can do a lot. <clears throat> All right. So that's what Delta does for us. Now, delta in the classic sense, the directional sensitivity, is one of the exposures of credit spreads. I can make a little bit of money or I can lose money on delta, that is, if the underlying stock goes up or down. But I can also make money on the third Greek we have to talk about called vega. Vega is extremely important. For credit spreads. So I need to consider that with every single credit spread I make. All right. Some people who are asking questions off topic, I'm going to I'm going to hold off. There's a couple on expiration dates, I'm going to get to those in just a second. <clears throat> now, when it's when you set up a credit spread, the first thing I do is I start with direction. Remember, if it's a call credit spread, I want the stock to not rise above the strike. If it's a put credit spread, I want the stock to not fall below the strike. So I need to kind of look at a stock chart. And the best tool that I have is support and resistance. What does resistance mean? Resistance means it's a point on the chart that the stock is at a hard time rising above, by definition. Well, isn't ex that exactly what I want when I have a call credit spread? I want the stock to have shown that it has a hard time rising above the strike price. So if I set my call short strike price to coincide with or above resistance, I can make money. With the put credit spread, <clears throat> I look for support. That's where the stock had a hard time falling below. So if I set my short strike at or below support, I have something that can potentially help me to make money. That is a little trick that we teach our students at Market Take. It's essential, really important stuff. Then we move on to volatility. Now, volatility, let me give you a little bit of a definition of volatility here. Well, I'll give you a definition. Well, yeah, let me give you a definition of volatility first. Volatility has a couple different meanings. Historical volatility is the volatility we already talked about. Historical volatility is how much the underlying moves around. It's the annualized standard deviation of the underlying stock. But the important volatility for option traders is implied volatility. That's basically how cheap or expensive options are. Now that may seem like a strange thing to say, like what do you mean volatility is how cheap or expensive options are? Like what does volatility have to do with how cheap or expensive options are? It actually has a lot to do with it because volatility uh, is really at the heart of option pricing. Why do people trade options? Well, one of two things. They trade to hedge and they tend to buy options when they fear volatility. When the market fears volatility, everybody comes and clamors for options. That drives up the price. When the market's really boring and complacent, Everybody sells options. They do things like credit spreads and covered calls and cash geared puts. That drives the price of options down. Same thing with speculators. Do you want to buy a call? Or do you want to buy a put if you don't think the market's going to move much? No, that's silly. You sell a call credit spread. So if you think the market's not going to move much, you're more inclined to sell options and buy them. If you think there's going to be a correction in the next two weeks, are you going to sell a call credit spread? No, that'd be silly. You leave a ton of money on the table. You'd rather buy options. You'd rather buy a put. So, yeah, there is a correlation between volatility and option prices, and that's called implied volatility. All right. Now, um, and Manuel and Don, I'm going to get to your questions in like one slide here. Here's a chart of uh, Ralph Lauren. Now, this is a trade I actually made. This is several years ago, but um, it's kind of perfect for this explanation. So even though I did this a few years ago, I'm going to keep it in here because 
I mean, it was just ideal to explain the perfect call credit spread setup. This was the perfect call credit spread setup. This stock was at 151 bucks. There was resistance at $165 a share, as you can see. That's about 10% away from the money. So I start thinking, yeah, maybe it makes sense to trade a call a credit spread. But I have to look at one more thing. I have to look at volatility. Delta-wise direction, the underlying wise, looks great. But what about volatility? <clears throat> well, I got to look at that. This is a volatility chart. Now, I don't have time to explain everything there is to know about volatility charts today, but I got a little bit of time. I'm going to explain them a little bit, as much time as we have. The red line is implied volatility. That's how cheap or expensive options are, you know, based on this volatility input, the, basically the supply and demand for options. The blue line is historical volatility. That's the volatility we talked about earlier. How, how much the underlying's moved around lately. So the red line, as of today, here in the uh, right-hand side, <clears throat> red line's above the blue line. That's one indication that options are expensive and overpriced and a good idea to sell. The other thing is we want to look at it relative to itself. Now, with equity options, this becomes tricky because leading up to earnings, implied volatility gets really high, but it gets high for a good reason. It gets high because on earnings, that's when the underlying stock can move around. So all the hedgers, all the speculators buy up options, and that makes their price go higher. All else held constant, both calls and puts. Now, you don't want to be putting on credit spreads right before earnings, because if there is a big move, that's bad. Remember, with credit spreads, we don't want a big move. So you never do them going into earnings. So what we're going to do is we're going to ignore earnings. You know, right now earnings is already out, so we don't have any worries. Earnings is not coming up soon. But these past earnings, like all these big climbs up going into earnings and then the crush on earnings day, got the same thing here. Those are kind of pro forma events. We're going to pretend that this little mountain right here doesn't exist. This little mountain right here doesn't exist. Anything leading up to a blue E, those elevated volatility levels, we're going to say they don't exist. And then we're going to say, well, where is today's implied volatility relative to the past six months if we ignore those big earnings mountains? And it's actually kind of high. It's not on the bottom. It's off the bottom. Ignoring these earnings mounts, it's, it's maybe in the top 50 percentile, 50th percentile. So that's another indication that implied volatility is high, meaning options are expensive. And when things are expensive, do we want to buy them? No, we want to sell them. So. This ends up looking like a nice call credit spread. I loved this trade when I put it on. Now the trade I put on was the 165, 170 call credit spread. Now, as I recall, and now I'm getting to Manuel and Don's questions from earlier, <clears throat> this was about a three week trade. Now Don asked earlier, why not use long call and put with the same strike and a three month date? What to buy a, wait, what to buy a straddle? That sometimes maybe you want to buy a straddle, but that's not in the scope of this presentation. I can only tell you about so many things in, you know, an hour. Um, but I, I, you sound like you've got some experience, Manuel, and I appreciate your question. I appreciate where you're going, but I just, that would take us so off topic. Everybody would be angry with you and me. So we can't have that, can we? Now, Don says, do you sell weekly calls and buy longer term protection? 90 days or so. No, I mean, that's, Don, that's called a diagonal. There are times when that's a good thing to do, but again, that's sort of out of the scope here, too. Oh, with your straddle? No, you'd never buy a straddle when earnings are about to be announced. That's the absolute worst time to buy a straddle. On the one hand, it seems like it's a good time to, but options are so overpriced, you'll, you'll get annihilated. Um, okay. Back to credit spreads. So what I did, because resistance was at 165 and because options were expensive, what I did is I sold the 165 calls and I bought the 170 calls. I collected about 65 cents. 
Now, mind you, the 165 strike was 10% higher than the stock price. That means if in three weeks the stock doesn't rally 10%, I make money. How's that for a bet? How's that for being the casino? Actually, I'm going to show you how I was really the casino on this trade in just a minute. <clears throat> so I made 60, I, I collected 65 cents with the stock down here at about 151. As long as it didn't rally all the way to 165, actually technically the break even is 165 and 65 cents. As long as it didn't rally 10%, I had a win. Goes down, make money, stays the same, make money, goes up 9%, I make money. Good trade from a pure probability standpoint. But, but is it a good trade? Well, that's where volatility comes in. And that's where I went from being gambler to being casino. <clears throat> because volatility was high, and I measured it to be uh, something like about five points high, I probably should have collected about 55 cents. That's about what the trade was really worth. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, it's roughly 10%, John. I mean, you know, get out of calculating and figure it out exactly, but it's close enough to 10%. Yeah, 151 to 165. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so because... Implied volatility was high and options were high. I that's 65 cents. Part of that was a gift. I really should have sold that for something like 55 cents. I was able to sell it about a dime higher than it, it should have been worth. So that makes my credit bigger, which means my maximum profit was bigger. If I collected 55 cents, which is what I should have if volatility was fairly priced, my max profit would have been 55 cents. I would have made a dime less. And my max loss would have been bigger. Because remember, the loss is the difference between the two strike prices, five minus 65. So that's $4.35 is my max loss. If I only collected 55 cents, my max loss would have been more. It would have been $4.45. Now, A, on the one hand, it's just a dime, but B, on the other hand, I mean, that's a dime. If I do this on every trade I trade, I'm basically making or making an extra dime on all my winners, losing a dime less than all my losers. A dime is $10. You know, how many people in this webinar would stab their mother if they could save five cents on their commissions? One, two, three, four. Okay, a lot of you guys. Five cents is literally five cents in commissions. It's a nickel. Five cents in option premium is five dollars of money. Ten cents, which is what we're talking about here, is ten dollars of money. Like people worry so much about saving a little bit of commission here and there. I'm showing you something that's way more important. Way more money in your pocket. You do this on every one of your trades, you go from wherever you are now as a trader to to making more on all your winners, losing less on all your losers, and all that adds up per contract by the end of the year. You'll see 2017 be way better than 2016 if you trade just as well. Just as well directionally. Trading with this, so much better. This is the most powerful thing I can teach any of my students, and I do. Uh, ben says, hi, Dan. I'm new. I'm very new to options trading. Can you email me a copy of this webinar? Ben, I, I, I'm not able to, I, I don't email out copies of the webinar. I'm sorry, man. But there is a recording and we're going to send you a recording of it and you can, you know, watch it a hundred times if you want and, and take notes. So uh, there's some takeaways here. Credit spreads, you know, a lot of you guys have probably traded credit spreads already. I think I just showed a lot of you guys one thing to layer on top of what you're already doing that can make you a lot more successful. 
all your winners bigger, all your losers smaller when, when you commit to only selling overpriced volatility. Now I gave you a little bit of a crash course, obviously, uh, and I, I, you know, I, it's not for lack of trying. I'm giving you everything I got. We're